So as you guys can tell, got my suspension parts back and my initial thought when I pulled them out of the box was I was kind of disappointed. I was shooting for a completely different color. I'll actually put a picture up on the screen right now of the color I requested and the color I got back was like this turquoise color. It's a really cool color. I think it would look great on certain bikes but not quite the look I was going for. So I contacted the company that did the coatings, SGB, and they said I could send them back to have them redone, but I simply just cannot wait the extra five or five and a half weeks to turn these parts around. So I'm just gonna have to slap these things together how they are. And it kind of bums me out. I've put so much time and effort into this bike and I don't like putting something together that isn't like what I had envisioned. But in this scenario, I think once I get it all together, it'll look pretty good. So the coating I had done is called a Thai nitride coating. And there's a few different reasons why people do this coating. And number one is it's much harder than the stock chrome finish. It'll hold up to dings and scratches better. Uh, number two, it produces less friction with the seals. So you have smoother suspension action. And number three, my favorite is it looks much better. You get a lot of cool colors out of this type of coating. And just to give you guys a general idea on pricing, most shops charge around six or 700 bucks for the fork tubes and 200 to 250 for the shock shaft. So I'm gonna start with the forks first. I'm gonna go grab all those parts, lay it out on the table and get assembling. This is gonna be fun. Man, it was forever ago when I took these things apart, so I'm kind of forgetting where to start. I guess that would be putting the lugs right onto those fork legs. Now, one thing to consider before you put the forks all the way together is you wanna measure the diameter and the length of the lower tubes, the dampening rods, and the upper tubes. That way, in the event that something gets broken or dented, you know exactly what size part you need to replace it. Now the lower tubes and upper tubes are the same from left to right, so it doesn't matter which side the lugs go on. Now the first step is to mate the fork lugs up to the tubes. So we'll need to pop in the bottoming cones with all new seals of course, and as this stuff goes together, I'll be using some fork oil to make it slide together. As for the O-rings, you can match these up at a local hardware store, or I believe they're still available from Showa or KYB. Now a couple things before you thread the lug onto the fork. Make sure there's no oil here on the threads. You want to use red Loctite to lock that lug into place. And make sure your bottoming cone is in and seated all the way. Have a O-ring on there with grease or oil on it. And at that point, we are ready to go. And then just start threading that thing on. Now, as far as tightening the lug onto the tube, the torque spec is around 100 foot-pounds but obviously it's kind of tough to correctly measure that. So what I've got set up here is I've got the tube and a tube clamp in the vise. Gonna slide the axle through the lug like we did in the video when I removed the lugs. And I'm gonna use that as like a lever to tighten the lug. So basically I'm just gonna tighten it until it wants to kind of spin here in the clamp. Man, that was pretty sketchy having the tube and the clamp, but thankfully, didn't scratch anything up. It's a pretty nice clamp. I'll actually drop a link down below to where I bought this. And one thing that helps too is squirting some Windex on the inside of the clamp. Helps keep things in place a little better. And thank God for my buddy Jared Keller who works over at JGRMX. The race team, he's been helping me out with all the specs, all the details on removing the lugs, reinstalling them. It's been a huge help and I'm also able to relay that info to you guys. So if you wanna pay a thank you to him or give him a follow, I will put his Instagram right here on the bottom of the screen. Now we just need to locate the locking screw for the lug. I'm gonna put some Loctite on the lock screw as well. Get this thing all tightened down. Keep in mind the threads are pretty small on this, so you can't absolutely crank on it. Now if you want a little extra security with that lock screw, you can peen the edge of it with something like this. So now I'll be working on getting the seals and bushings into place. I'll be using SKF seals. These are widely known to be some of the best seals out there. 
snag these over at Rocky Mountain. You'll need a seal guide to get the seals on. You don't want to cut them up on the sharp edges on the tube. And it's always nice to have a diagram here. That way you know how everything goes. You can print these out over at the Rocky Mountain OEM parts diagram. Now at start, I'm gonna slip on the bullet, put some oil on. The first thing that goes on is the dust seal. You want the spring side facing down. Then we've got a clip and the actual oil seal. You want oil on the inside of this as well. And for this one, you want the taller lip to be facing the bottom of the fork. So it goes on just like this. Now the bullet can come off, got a washer, and then the thinner bushing, and finally the fatter bushing. This bushing fits right into the top groove on the tube. All right, it's getting real guys. Time to slide the two tubes together. Just wanna make sure all of the bushings and seals have a nice coat of oil on them, and you just slide them together. Just gonna start pressing in the oil seal by hand. And the rest of the way, we'll need to use a fork seal driver. And believe it or not, I've actually never used a fork seal driver before. I always used a uh, piece of PVC pipe, but I figured I might as well get the right tool for the job. And this is what we have here, a Tusk fork seal driver. So let's give it a shot. Just take the two halves, slide them together around the tube and you should be able to push that seal right into its home. Now to get the seal in the rest of the way, you may need to slide hammer the driver a little bit on the tube. Now if you're gonna slide the driver on the tube, it's a good idea to have some oil in between there. Now that we're able to see the groove for the clip, just simply pop that thing into place. You'll definitely wanna hear a click when that clip goes into the groove, like that. And last up is the dust seal. These can just be pressed in by hand. Got the fork set up in the vise so that way I can pop in the spring and the damper assembly. Before I slide this in, I always like to make sure that the lock nut is threaded all the way up. And in we go. Now to get the rebound adjuster threaded onto the fork, this is what holds everything kind of in place. I'll need to compress the spring and then use a damper holding tool to hold the rod out. And that way I can thread this on. The next step is to slide the rod for the rebound adjuster into place. Then we've got the actual adjuster itself. Then the torque spec for the adjuster to the rod is 16 foot-pounds. Now I'm going to carefully compress the fork once again and slide this tool out of place. And you just want to ease it into those threads there. Nice and slow. Once I got the adjuster tightened down, I'm going to torque it to 51 foot-pounds. Now we're gonna go ahead and add some oil. These things are actually coming along pretty good and that color combo is starting to grow on me. Kinda digging it now. The only thing I would change is to have a black fork cap. But other than that, all looks great. Now for fork oil, I'll be using 13.7 ounces of oil for each fork and I'll be using Maxima 5 weight. And at this point, just a matter of threading the cap on. All right, my work here on the forks is done. I'm just gonna tighten up the caps once I have the forks and the clamps. But overall, pretty pumped on how these came out. Can't wait to get them on the bike. Now, one thing I learned in talking with SGB is that the color can vary quite a bit from fork to fork. It's kind of difficult to nail down a certain color. Like I sent him a picture of what I wanted and I ended up getting something a little bit different, but that's not to say the coating itself is bad. It's not gonna scratch or flake off any easier. So just keep that in mind when you have a set of tubes coated, 
The color might be slightly different, but the quality of the coating won't be compromised. But now that the forks are all together, I think I can work with that. Looks pretty good. Now I've had some questions on these fork bleeders. People are asking if they leak. These are from Works Connection. I've always had good luck with these in the past. Never had any issues with them leaking or sucking air in. Now I would say if you go with a quality set, then you should be fine and not have to worry about that. Don't go anywhere guys, we still have the shock to put back together. But man, this thing is gonna be trick. I love that color combo. Step one is to get the clevis back on the shaft. Got the shock shaft in the shock clamp and the vise. And the first thing to do is get the rebound adjuster rod through the shaft. Grease that thing up nice and good. And now the retaining nut can be threaded on. Before I put Loctite on those threads, gonna make sure there's no grease on there. And the Loctite I'll be using is the same as the forks, the red 271. And now we're ready for the clevis. And just like the fork lugs, I'm gonna crank on this thing pretty good. I think the torque spec is around 50 or 60 foot pounds. But once again, can't really uh, measure that very accurately. So next up we have the rebound adjuster and you want to make sure all the previous markings from the locking screw are filed down or else the adjuster won't fit into the clevis very well. And of course while you have the adjuster off the clevis, always a good idea to clean it up and regrease it. I'm going to put the screw in on the bottom. This screw is what kind of guides the adjuster into place. Use a little bit of blue Loctite on it. That's a little bit more than a little. Now we're gonna to wanna to pack some grease inside this clevis. So that way the adjuster works smoothly. Got a little carried away with the grease there, but definitely can't hurt. The slot is gonna go facing down toward the screw that we just installed. And so just push that sucker right in. This thing just took a piss all over my table. I'm gonna to wanna to turn the adjuster all the way clockwise until it stops. And of course, we'll have to fish all that grease out of the lock screw threads. I'll be using red Loctite on that. Man, that adjuster is buttery now. Not gonna lie, I'm pretty pumped on this shock. These colors are really gonna stand out. Next up, we gotta get all of this onto the shaft in the correct order. First up is the cup for the bottoming cone, followed by the bottoming cone itself. This one's pretty cool, all black. Usually they come in this really ugly yellow color. Ooh, this one's tough going on there. Then we've got the cap for the bottom of the shock body. Next in line, we have the seal head, but we'll need to put seal bullet on top of the shaft to protect the seals. Dab some oil on this thing and on we go. And last up is the shim stack and piston assembly. You need to cut the zip tie that holds this together. Gotta be really careful. Gotta keep all of this together. And on to the shaft we go. Just like that. And then I'll wipe the threads because we'll be putting some Loctite for the nut there. Gonna bust out the red Loctite once again. We're gonna torque this one to 27 foot pounds. And I'm actually gonna swap out this piston band for an OEM Honda one. This one on here has been giving me some issues. So to get them off, you simply just cut them right off. And there's a couple O-rings underneath that we're gonna replace. We'll see if there's any way I can get this band on by hand. Yeah, I'm gonna have to use some sort of assistance here. I think I've used a fork bullet in the past. Let's see if this works. Man, that actually worked pretty good using the bullet. Now the last thing I'll be doing is peening the edge of the nut to keep that sucker in place. Now the next step in the process is to install the shock shaft, the compression adjuster, and the bladder and cap into the shock body along with some oil 
without introducing any air into the system. That's very important. And make sure before you start, you have the spring nuts on the shock body. Those can't go on later on. I learned my lesson the hard way one time and had to take the shock completely apart just to get those nuts on. So learn from my mistake. You're gonna wanna have the compression adjuster and rebound adjuster turned all the way soft. So all the way to the left, that's good there. And then you wanna make sure that the rebound shaft is pushed all the way down inside. Just a light push with the screwdriver should ensure that. Now, before we get started bleeding the shock, I must say there are a couple different ways to go about this. Some people use a vacuum pump, some people do it manually. So I'll be doing it manually, and the method I'm using is a little bit different than what most people do. I originally got the idea from Racetech. I saw them do it, and to me, it makes the most sense and seems to be the easiest. So we're gonna start with the shock and the vise. You're definitely gonna want a set of soft jaws for this. So we've got the compression adjuster here. Obviously, like I said earlier, turned all the way to soft. Put a little oil on these O-rings, and then thread it into the shock body. And then go ahead and tighten that sucker down. Now with the shock body upright in the vise, I'm gonna fill the reservoir side with oil. I'm using Maxima 7 weight here. We're gonna fill it up about three quarters of the way. And you wanna make sure that fluid is transferring over to the shock body side. When you have your compression adjuster softened all the way, that'll allow the fluid to work its way over to the other side. And you can actually cup your hand over the reservoir side to try to force that fluid through and also work out any bubbles in there. Wow, the fluid actually went down quite a bit in doing that. I have to add some more. I'm gonna do that again, it seemed to work pretty well. And if you lightly tap around the compression adjuster down here at the bottom, that'll help work out any air bubbles. Now with the reservoir filled up about two thirds or three quarters of the way, we're gonna push in the bladder and cap. Definitely make sure that fluid is coming out of there. That ensures that there's no air trapped inside. And just go ahead and push that bladder and cap all the way inside of the shock. Definitely a messy process here. So just push it down far enough to expose that gap for the circlip. Pretty simple deal to work this thing in. You wanna make 100% sure that that thing's in the groove. To seat that cap against the circlip, we'll need to add about 50 PSI to the bladder. Now we're gonna fill up the other half of the body about an inch and a half from the top. Go ahead and grab your shaft and we're gonna start working this thing in. Man, this thing is really coming together. Now with the shaft pretty much compressed all the way in the body, we're gonna make sure the fluid level is still above the piston. And the key here to bleeding is to compress the piston fast fast enough to open up the valving or open up the shims to allow fluid and therefore air to travel out. And then when you're rebounding or pulling the shock back out, you wanna go really slow. So in fast and out slow. And one thing to keep in mind is you don't wanna pull the piston up high enough to where the fluid level goes below it. If you do that, you're just bringing air back in. So we're gonna go down fast. It's kinda tough with a new piston band. It's a little stiff. And then rebound out slow. So as you're bleeding the air of the system, when you're compressing the shock shaft, you'll hear the bubbles come out. It'll sound kinda like Rice Krispies and milk. That's kind of the best way to explain it. And then when you don't have any air in there, it'll sound smooth, kind of like two pieces of paper rubbing against each other. And while you have the shaft all the way extended, it can help to kind of tap on the body a little bit with the soft hammer. That can help work out some of those bubbles. All right, I'm gonna do this one more time. I usually like to do it five times to make sure that there's no air trapped in there. And then after I bleed the shock five times, I'll push the shaft down really fast as if I was bleeding it again. And then I'll let it sit for about 15 minutes and that should work any possible air bubbles out. Now, after it's been sitting for 15 minutes, I'm gonna pull the shaft back up to the top of the stroke. And at this point, I'm gonna make sure the shock body is completely 
completely topped off with fluid. And this is where it kind of gets messy. So wrap a rag around the shock and start to bring down the seal head. Just work it really slow. And you'll notice there's a little hole right here that allows air to escape. So just continue pushing down that seal head, let some air escape out of there. So just maintain constant pressure on that seal head till there's no more air bubbles coming out. There, it looks like we're good. So with continuous pressure on that seal head, let some air out of the bladder. And you'll see the seal head will start to go into the body. There we go. All right, here we are. Time to get that circlip in place. Now, once you've made sure that circlip is all the way in the groove, time to pop on the end cap. So you want the holes on the end cap to be facing front to back of the bike. And the reasoning for that is if you get water inside the cap, you want these holes to be facing front to back. So that way that water and dirt drains out. Now we're gonna finish it up by tapping this cap into place with a rubber mallet. I just can't wait to get the spring on now. This is gonna be sick. Make sure this thing is going on the right way. Should match up with that top collar pretty good. You can see it doesn't quite seat up there. So I'll need to flip it around. Oh boy, it is getting real. And we've got this little collar that goes on the bottoming cone. Like so. And last up, we've got the retaining clip. Snaps right into that groove. Make sure it's on all the way and then lock that collar against it. We're dialed. Now just a matter of tightening down the spring. And of course, we're gonna need to fill up the bladder with nitrogen. You definitely do not wanna use air. Nitrogen is a much more stable gas. So the spec for this shock is 145 PSI. So I'm gonna drag this thing over to my buddy's house. He's got a nitrogen tank and uh, go ahead and fill it up. But you can drop it by a motorcycle shop. They'll be able to do it for you. If I remember right, it's about 15 or $20. Oh, and obviously I'm missing the top shock bearing. So once that comes in, I'm gonna press it in and this shock will be 100% ready to go on the bike. All right, guys, the suspension is all done. Pretty much ready to bolt onto the bike. Really pumped on how this stuff came out. At first, I wasn't quite sure about the color of the tubes or the shock shaft, but over the course of the video, the color really grew on me. And now that I have everything together, I think it turned out really good. I can't wait to see how it looks on the bike. So I will drop a link down below to the company that did the coatings, SGB. I mean, I was kind of bummed out that the color was a little bit off, but overall, I mean, dude, this looks sweet. So. I got nothing to complain about. Now, some of you guys might be wondering why I decided not to do any spring or valving changes while I had the suspension apart. Now, the plan is to put the suspension on the bike, ride it with the stock springs and stock valving just to see how terrible it is. It's not gonna be set up for me at all. And then I'm gonna compare it side by side stock versus having someone go through, respring it, revalve it for me and uh, show you guys how big of a difference that stuff makes. So that video will be coming once I get the bike up and going and on the track. Should be a good one. And just a friendly reminder for you guys, I still have the Steel Horse giveaway going on that ends this Sunday, September 15th. So the giveaway is for a swing arm bolt system that allows you to grease the swing arm pivot bearings without having to take anything apart on the bike. Pretty cool setup. I'll actually show you what it's all about on the bike. So this setup replaces your swing arm pivot bolt and the bushings that go inside the swing arm. And then it's got a grease fitting on both ends of it. You stick grease gun, give it a couple pumps, and that's all it takes to grease those bearings inside of there. Pretty cool deal. If you want to enter the giveaway, I will drop the link to that down below in the description. Well guys, thank you so much for joining me on the suspension build. I had a ton of fun and I'm really pumped on how everything turned out. And you guys will have to stay posted for the next video coming out. We'll be bolting the suspension back on the bike and possibly finishing up the bike. We'll see about that, I'm not quite sure yet. But either way, that'll make for one heck of a video. I can't wait. So until next time, keep it prime.